program to a point that it is very different from what it was when it was first established. Well, that first tent care that we had back in 95, that is what the Obamacare rollout is very similar to. And it is much more similar to that. And I repeatedly asked Secretary Sebelius, are you all looking at tent care? Are you looking at our lessons learned? Are you talking to people in Tennessee that are on the ground that were responsible for this? And they did not. The answer I got from the secretary in the letter was they did not consider this to be a traditional public option health care program. And of course, Tend Care Today is very different. And um, that's why I continue to say my goal is to make certain that we preserve access to affordable health care for all Tennesseans, for all of our citizens. And we do have some growing support, some bipartisan support in the Senate because people realize they're going home, they're talking to constituents, they realize this just does not work. And you cannot not pay people. We've got some physicians' practices that have had to go to the bank to borrow money to bank payroll, you know, because the reimbursement rates are so slow. That's exactly what we saw in those early days of tent care. And so, if you got paid at all, that's exactly right. And I had some people that got paid 120 and 180 days out. And you just can't keep the doors open. Our goal is to make certain that that accessible health care here in the community level is available. You know what's so sad? The the cost on health care has has gone up tremendously. Yes. But if you look, especially you know like. The home health, I, you know, like I said, I have been in home health for eons. And the home health benefits for, you know, for these patients, that has not changed since 1986. It has not changed. These people are still eligible for the same thing that they were in 1986. And that's when the, you know, the home health aid um, uh, clause was put in that the home health aid could be in a home up to 40 hours a week, who can afford that? Right. You know, and so what's changed as far as the home health benefit is the way home health agencies are being reimbursed and to manage that cost. But the benefit, the patient is losing out. The patient has, has that has not changed at all. Right. I am fully aware of home health with my dad uh, until this, in the past few months when we Exactly what you're talking about, and we have I dealt mean, right. With you know, because we were on per yeah. visit, we were in, you know, right. the IPS, then PPS, and now, you know, um, pay for performance. Um, so, you know, it's it's all it's all with the revenue, but no one's looking at the patient yeah. and right. their needs. And I fully appreciate that, and that's why. I continue to say we've got to leave those decisions with the patients and providers and give you all a little bit of flexibility to change, you know, to work within a certain framework, but um, look at what the needs of that patient are and how to best meet those because everything is not a one size fits all. Exactly. And so we are uh, very mindful of that. And I think probably I'm a little bit more sensitive to it because I dealt with it with the grandmother. Um, I, I managed the long-term care of my in-laws and they were in Texas and uh, we kept them at home the entire time and had caregivers that were coming in. My mother-in-law died of Alzheimer's. Um, my dad has Alzheimer's now. My mom is still at home. So I'm handling, handling that you know, it, it, when you're doing it long distance, you uh, it's tough, but then also I'm grateful that I've got the opportunity and I'm grateful for the insight that it gives me on sitting down and working directly with that home health nurse to talk with her and to figure out exactly, you know, what the availabilities are now in a facility, looking at uh, the staff and, and uh, how, we, how we approach you know, decisions that we make them. So, all right, anybody else?
comments? Anything you want me to know? I'm sorry, Jimmy. On, uh, I, I don't understand how the government can make it so damn consumer on Medicare Part D. I mean, you know, they throw this stuff at people that know nothing about it. And it's so confusing. And every plan is different. They throw, give the insurance companies all this money to spend, and I guess they spend it on advertising and they pocket it. But and, you know, the reimbursement is horrible. But the consumer, I mean, I, when it first came out, I had lawyers and insurance agents and I come to talk to me about trying to figure out what it was. And it's so complicated. And every year, it's the same thing. They mail them all this stuff, and it's just totally confusing. And I don't understand why they have to do that. I, I'm with you. That's why, as I was saying, you know, the number three thing that we hear from people is simplify the system. Yeah. Let us know what we bought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but every plan so, on that is just probably 40 or 50. They pay for different drugs. Exactly. This one will pay for this one, this one won't. And, you know, and it just causes all kinds of problems. And they change during the year. Right. We have people get prescriptions the next <coughs> month it'll pay for it, the next month it won't. Right. You know, and, and that's not fair. Right. I, I, I mean, I feel, I feel for us not getting paid enough, don't get me wrong, but I feel for consumer motor because they're the ones that have to put up with all this. Right. I, I, I fully appreciate what you're saying, and I am so in agreement with you, uh, because if we cannot simplify the system, it is just so difficult for people. You know, and I, I, I have had so many people say, I want it in plain English, I want to be able to know, I want to be able to say, I need this, 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 and this. Tell me what it is going to cost me. Yeah. And then let me plan. Give me a, give me the chance to work my budget for the year. Well, but don't yank me around. Trying to yeah. figure out what they want. I mean, they come to me to have them, and I try to have them, but you know, when you get 40 or 50 plans, who can have them? Right. Yeah, you know. exactly. And then, the mercy of what they hear on television is what it is. And then, I have those not right. Right. Right, and then, you know, they they get in the plan, and then changes are made, and then they have to call the insurance company. I, we've actually had this conversation with a lot of our providers, and they will say they feel like it's subjective, depending on who uh, who is on the phone with them to say if they will or will not allow it, and then they send the claim in, the provider sends a claim in, or the patient sends a claim in, right. and then it's rejected, and then they have to go back and send it again, mm -hmm. and you know they hope they kept the note and the name of the person from the phone call that approved it, yeah. and, um, and so this is the kind of y'all do that every day. Yeah, this right. is the note person mm -hmm. right here. Cheryl keeps the notes. <laughs> yes. Isn't that amazing? You have to be able to say at 10 a.m. on the 15th I talked to whomever. And they gave me the approval. And I was talking with somebody the other day that had called an insurance. They were trying to battle out a claim with an insurance company. And they said the insurance company said, well, we record all of our phone calls. Mm -hmm. So we'll just go pull that. And they said, well, you go pull it. Because this is what they told me. And they have not heard one word from that insurance company <laughs> since then. But it is. the bottom line of one of the concerns that I have is what Jimmy just uh, start on was that when these rules change and all the health care providers are at a loss of what to do, there are human beings dying. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's the bottom line. Absolutely. Of that. The statistic, and is that an ultimate mm -hmm. plan? Is there a plan? Because everybody knows there's way too many senior citizens. Mm -hmm. The baby boomers, here we are. Mm -hmm. Is this an agenda? Well, my plan is, is, it, is it an agenda? My plan is to clean it up, and that's why I, I go in every day and keep putting ideas on the table to find things that are going to be workable, because the way they're approaching it right now, with an IPAP board and preventive health services making the decisions and then mandating to you what you're going to have to provide, and the insurance company can't make up their mind what they're going to pay for or what they're going to send and when they're going to pay you, that is not a workable system. 
And you're exactly right. Well, it's just it's, it's just so it's contrary so to the concept of this nation. Yes. That we are so, um, you know, we're so insensitive now that everything is statistical and everything is driven by knowledge, but there's human beings out there who are suffering and, and dying Absolutely. as a result of us not understanding how to work a system that's of over a thousand pages. Right. Long. And that's why, well, 2,700 pages long with 3,400 new mandates, that's why the patient, we need a patient-centered, patient-driven system. And the patient, the provider, and that family need to be able to make those decisions. That needs to be what we all agree to. And then say, how do we make that happen? Yeah, Basically, she said what I was about to say, and so did he. These little patients are vulnerable. You know, We get residents that come to, uh, to long-term care, and they will have insurance companies call them, and they have no idea what they've done. And they're giving up their right to Medicare for long-term care and home health. And they don't know they've done it. Somebody from an insurance company calls them and says, this is what you need to do, and they do it. And that same insurance company has a major marketing program on TV that you all probably are aware of. I'm not going to say their name, but every time it comes on, I cringe because we have to deal with teaching these people that you gave up your Medicare rights. You, it no longer will pay for your Part A in long-term care or home health. And that's, they're vulnerable. They don't know what they've done. They're just going on what somebody teaches them and tells them, which is wrong, you know, and they I, don't I know that. that. And, you know, I spend um, <coughs> two, three days a week, maybe more than that, almost all day long, begging, begging mm -hmm. to see these people. Yes. Begging for somebody that has, uh, I mean, this, we've got a patient now that, I mean, she is so sick, but they gave us three visits mm -hmm. to do everything you need to do for this lady in three visits. But she's back in the hospital now, so which is truly the least expensive, the least expensive for us to see her at home and teach her and keep her out of the hospital or for her to go back to the hospital because they wouldn't let us do anything else. Well, the, the public hasn't really been, you know, educated as far as what an, an advantage plan has been. Right. You know, because the I'm, I will say probably 95 percent of these people who are enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan, they think they are um, enrolling in a Part D prescription drug. Exactly. Plan. They have no idea that they're allowing someone else. To, you know, you know, to um, manage their Medicare benefits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because they say, oh, I have Medicare. I have my Medicare card. Yes, you do. But mm -hmm. these people over here right. are going to manage it. And they're not going to let you have it. So, exactly. Or call me on the phone. Call me on the phone and promise me.